Welcome. So this is PHY 2049 Laboratory on Tuning Circuits. And it's a dry laboratory because you couldn't make it into the, the lab today for some reason. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk a fair bit about the background to this. So what is our objective? Remember, put this in your in your notebook and our objective today is oh I'm sorry let's let's begin so today is lab and I can't remember the number it changes from semester to semester and this is tuning circuit lab and you put down today's day and remember you always put down a, a sequential page number so by now we're on page 47 or something out of your lab book if you put anything on that page put a number on it so that page can be referenced and then we have an objective and today we predict the tuning frequency if you like it's more commonly called the resonant frequency of a tuning circuit and these are well I prefer to call them LRC network but more commonly they're called uh, I think it's LCR networks uh, RLC networks I like it in this order because that's the order that they go in the phaser diagram um, using omega is equal to the square root of 1 over LC there's the equation we compare <coughs> our prediction with the measured characteristic of the circuit so we always try and compare theory with with experimentation and, and there it is so let's look at some background so I don't often do a background but this is a little bit involved so it might be useful to to look at um, we know that for inductors if I plot X which is the inductive impedance let's call it XL which is in ohms versus Omega which is in radians per second that's the frequency then what I'll get is a linear relationship and what that means is that at low frequencies this is just like a piece of wire and so it has very little resistance but at high frequencies not only do you get the resistance of the wire but you get these 
magnetic effects which are frequency dependent. So at low frequencies you tend to get your signal is passed by this unit and at high frequencies it tends to limit your signal. So this would be called a low pass filter. It lets low frequencies through but not high frequencies. And if we had a capacitor and we plot XC which is in ohms versus the frequency. This frequency is the driving frequency, the frequency you're trying to get through the device in radians per second. Then what we find is that it goes like this. It's an inverse uh, relationship. And what we see here is that at low frequencies the capacitor gets you, but at high frequencies the capacitor lets you through. And so this is a high pass filter. And just for completeness, for a resistor, if I plot my resistance which is in ohms versus my radians per second it's not affected, it's just got a given value. Uh, for completeness, XL is equal to omega L, XC equals 1 over omega C, and R is R. Not frequency dependent at all. Now, Let's go to the next page. If I build a circuit where I have a, this is the symbol for AC source. It's like a battery, but it gives you alternating signals. And then this is a, let's do them in the order, inductor, resistor, capacitor, so L, R, C. If I was to plot the voltages of these out, so let's say we have a what's called a phasor diagram. And I was to take a snapshot at that, at that right hand side and let's say that in the remember there's a sine wave going through all, every bit of this but they're not in phase so if I was to look at the current I then I would see the voltage across the resistor R would be exactly in phase. When the current went through a maximum, that voltage across the resistor, I'm sure I should say VR, was a maximum. They'd be in phase with each other. Now, the inductor is 90 degrees in front. So this is VL. And my capacitor is 90 degrees behind V uh, uh, C and so the overall voltage is a vector summation of those three I'll make it black those three black arrows
and that just makes it interesting that just makes it uh, more complicated but but not impossible what we're really interested in is the inductance the 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 uh inductive reactance the resistance and the inductive capacitance because what we find is if i pin my resistance to the side because it's just easier to see this way and i plot my xl is again always 90 degrees ahead 90 degrees ahead and xc my capacitive reactance is 90 degrees behind then what i see is that i get well these two xl and xc fight each other so it goes to about there and my resistance is about there and the resultant is called z z equals impedance measured in ohms and that's what affects how well this the z is what affects how well the signal gets through the circuit if it's a low z i get a lot of signal if it's a high z a lot of resistance i get a low signal now if i think back about my diagram for my x l x c and resistance let's put my resistance low i can i can intuit the fact that you know there's a there's a sweet spot here and i can say well there's my sweet spot if i am at a lower frequency than this At lower frequencies my capacitor is killing me and at higher frequencies my inductor is killing me so this sweet spot is the signal which I can then hear when I amplify the signal so what I'm saying is that there might be a radio station here, there might be a radio station there, there might be a radio station there. These are different frequencies. And although my radio is picking up all these radio stations, I won't hear that one because the capacitor killed it. I won't hear this one and I won't hear that one because the inductor killed it. I'll only hear the one that's in the sweet spot. And that's the, the game we're playing. Now, it, it turns out this diagram is a little bit misleading because it implies I'm adding these reactances arithmetically, when in fact it's, it's even more interesting. When x L is equal to XC because they are 90 degrees to each other we get no uh, um, no re no uh, X equals zero if you like there's no resistance because they cancel each other out and if XL equals Omega L and xc equals 1 over omega c which they do then omega squared is equal to 1 over lc and omega is equal to if you like the square root of 1 over lc this is called the resonant 
frequency or the tuning frequency and we can define it like this. So this is an important relationship, this is an equation that you should know, as is the one for impedance etc. There's, there's a number of equations here that we should know. So our job today will be to build this circuit and we will predict, we predict this resonant frequency and then we measure the resonant frequency and we compare see how see how close they are so that's what we're going to do today now we don't have the equipment in front of us because we're doing this at home or in, in the library or somewhere so this is what it looks like so you get a, a better idea this is actual apparatus we use in the lab and you can't, I, mean, I don't see a way you can get this picture, maybe you can download it and um, you know, print it and stick it in your lab book, but I don't expect it to be in your lab book. But I want to show you some things. So first of all, this thing at the back, this is, this is a so-called function generator. This is the power supply. And it's got a whole bunch of different knobs on it, and the important thing is that we have at the side here, this is not showing up too well, is it? At the side there, we have a frequency knob, not a very good one, it's cheap, not very precise. And then here, we have a series of frequency buttons, so we can change the scale, zero to 20, uh, sorry, 2 to 20, 20 to 200, 200 to 2000, all that kind of stuff. And then on this side we have three different functions. We have a so-called sine wave, a square wave and a sawtooth wave. And then here we have some uh, different uh, uh, function buttons. Um, and then here we have some control of those function buttons and all we need to know is that we want this output level to be as big as possible and we want our so this is a coaxial cable a shielded cable and we want this in output And this shielded cable basically is designed so that there's little interference with the signal. It uses the, on signals there's usually a ground and there's a hot. So hot and ground, like two wires. And if you put the ground around the hot, it makes a little Faraday cage. We did that in class, didn't talk about this. And so it's shielded and so you can have electrical signals outside and they're not picked up by one of the wires. If I had a long speaker cable where the two wires are just side by side and I traipsed it across my room and then I listened with uh, uh, headphones to the output, I would get a hum because of the lights and because of all this stuff. But by using a so-called coaxial coaxial cable what that means then is that I can shield it so this coaxial cable is just delivering the signal and it goes around here not very well done and then I have it connected to one end of this circuit and then the other end of this circuit and this circuit consists of rather a clunky inductor a kind of biggish capacitor and then a resistor and then there's a bridging cable which goes from one end of the resistor to the capacitor so I go I go 
if you like from the hot side I go my inductor and then I feed into my resistor and then I feed into my capacitor and then I come back again now these components don't need to be in that order but it's nice to keep reinforcing LRC just like in the phaser diagram we just drew LRC now how do I measure the signal that gets through this circuit well the signal that gets through this circuit is to all intents and purposes the current flow through the circuit bigger the I bigger the signal and my current flow through the circuit is most easily measured by measuring the resistance across sorry the voltage delta V across the resistor bigger the delta V the bigger the I the bigger the I the bigger the signal so that's why I have that meter it's a digital meter and then this other meter is specifically used in this experiment to measure frequency it turns out that this frequency control is awful you set it to 20 and who knows what it could be in terms of its frequency so it's awful and imprecise and so we put a frequency meter across the inputs and this measures our frequency and if we work in uh, angular frequency it's whoa angular frequency is omega and if I work in linear frequency it's, it's, it's Hertz and Hertz it's frequency in Hertz and it's angular frequency in radians per second So let's do a setup. So we'll do a setup. And I'm going to do two diagrams. The first diagram I'm going to do is a kind of functional diagram. And I'm going to do a board and you may recall it went inductor and then it went resistor and then it went capacitor and so I took my coaxial cable and I put it across those two this is coax and I put a jumper cable across here and then I took a frequency meter and I put it across those two and I took a voltage meter uh, let me replace that that's not in a very good position I took a voltage meter and I put it across there and they're going to do another diagram underneath it which has so there's the signal for my there's the symbol for my signal generator here are my symbols for the different components so this is a schematic diagram and what I added was a frequency meter across there 
and what I added was a voltmeter across there. Cool. Um, sure, we had any uh, knots on this. The signal out is given by the current through the circuit this current is is indicated by the voltage across the resistor. Just scratching my nose, I'm not supposed to do that, am I? Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. So, the next thing to do is to try to predict, so let's call this prediction of the resonant frequency. And we, we know that omega naught is equal to the square root of 1 over LC. And it turns out that you can use a thing called an uh, LRC meter. And you can measure these components. Somebody uh, had done that on the back. And what they'd found was that L in, in our group, because now I'm, your, I'm the, your lab partner, so we look at the back and L turns out to be uh, 8.51 8 six Henry's. And then the next thing we want is C and C turned out to be 1.7423 microfarads and so we don't need R at the minute and so and so those two we should be able to work out what our value is why do we do this lab partner and that is I'm gonna work out what I find and then you work out what you find and we'll compare answers okay so I'm gonna go hmm, let's have a look uh, five one six times one point seven four two three second e e to the minus six n so multiply those together and then do the inverse of them which is somewhere there and then do uh, a second square root second square root second answer and what are you getting buddy and hopefully you get in the omega naught is equal to two five nine point six radians per second now just to forewarn you i took a quick look and I saw that the frequency, the function generator and the frequency meter in Hertz. 
so I need to be able to convert so omega is equal to 2 pi f so f is equal to omega over 2 pi so f naught the frequency in Hertz of this thing is going to be that divided by 2 enter divided by pi enter and I'm going to get 41.3 Hertz now just a just a forewarn it's never a bad time to just double check on calculator stuff if I put in 259.6 and then I go divided by 2 pi I get 407 not 41.3 because the calculator thinks you're dividing by 2 and then multiplying by pi so you either got to use parentheses or what I do is I go 259.6 divided by 2 enter divided by pi enter and that will give you the right answer so so I'm expecting a sweet spot a characteristic now what's it going to look like I'm going to plot my current versus my frequency and there's going to be a sweet spot somewhere and I'm going to get some kind of peak and it tends to be shown as a symmetrical peak although that tends to be for better tuners than we have if you think about it the if that's a linear and that's a inverse it's not really symmetrical is it so I'd be surprised if we got a symmetrical function but that's the value I'm aiming for so now I need to set up and do the experiment so now we're going to do the experiment and just to talk you through a little bit I don't expect you to write this down but but basically with this turn to maximum to get the biggest signal I'm going to adjust this and I'm going basically around 40 Hertz so I'm going to go down to maybe 20 and then up to something like 60 or 80 Hertz and I'll be reading those Hertz values on this display and then I'll be recording the voltage on this display now this is set to AC volts not DC this is the AC signal and um, we'll see how it goes now just a, another word and that is the fact that um, we tend well let's let's change pages so this is going to be measurement so let's go uh, measured characteristic just a couple of words in philosophy first of all um, okay we get used to lab manuals which have 10 spaces for data so we collect 10 pieces of data and another time it collects two pieces of data so we put down two pieces of data and we never have to make the decision of how many pieces of data we need and then you get into the big wide world and you're not doing stuff out of a lab book anymore and you're supposed to think for yourself and you've never actually been faced with the prospect of how many pieces of data to collect even why you collected 10 in some cases 
So let's recall, you tend to collect more pieces of data when a, 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 a value is fluctuating. Well, it's not quite that. We're going to have different pieces of data collected on, on different parts of this characteristic. All right, with a graph, the mantra always comes back, you need five data points for a straight line, and that's actually, you need a minimum of five. The more the better and I think you're getting that because we've done scatter and we see that when they're scattered the more points the better this is a nonlinear graph and so man, how many data points do we need for this and the answer is as many as it takes to get confidence and then what values, if I'm going from say 20 hertz to 60 hertz, do I go 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60? And I think that would be a disaster because we're trying to find the peak on the graph. And so I want more data points around the peak than I do around the shoulders. Oh, but that's hard to see. How do you know where the peak is until you plot it? Bingo! How do you know where the peak is until you plot it? And so, um, what we need to do is we need to take more data points around where the peak is. And so, in the ideal world, what you'll do is you'll go to the conditions that give you the maximum peak and then you'll spread out from there but you get more readings about the natural the actual peak so you ideally you'll plot the graph as well as taking the data you don't take the data and then plot the graph ideally you look at your graph to say do i need any more data points and so I'm going to try and model that today. I don't know if my lab partner did it that way, but that's the way we're going to do it today. So let's, let's, let me get my head together and then we'll begin. So got the data here. Let's go to a, a new page in the lab book. Remember, you're going to go, you're going to go three steps in and three steps up and I'm looking at this vertical axis which is my delta V across the resistor which is measured in volts and looking at this I'm going to about 3.5 something like that so I, I look up this and I count the number of squares and you could go one, two, three and a half, and you're way too small. So it's probably better to go to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Now, whatever works for your book, but this is going to, woo, yeah, that's right. This is going to work for mine. Remember, we use one for one one little square for one unit, we use two for one, we'll never use three for one, four for one's okay, five for one is much better, never six, never seven, eight for one's okay, nine for one is never, ten for one is okay. So we try and keep it to a scale which is really manageable. You don't want some wacky scale because you won't be able to read anything from it and your graph will be plotted wrong. So whatever works for you. And then looking the other way, looking at our data, we're going for uh, frequencies 
uh, let's have a look. Oh, we go up to uh, roundabout. This is, you know, our decision. But we go into roundabout. Uh, it looks like a hundred and one hundred and twenty. So, do I want to go all the way up to there? I want my thing to be roughly in the middle, about 40. So I'm going to go up to about 80. Yeah, I'm going to go up to about... Um, boom, 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 boom. There's a 60 there. I'm going to go up to about uh, uh, 80. So I'm going to go... Uh, let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five. Let's call that ten. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twenty, thirty, forty. Fifty. 60, 70, 80. So this would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. I'm over halfway across the page, that's what I want. This is frequency and this is in Hertz. So there's my two axes. I shouldn't go outside those two. I should be fine on this. And then the next thing I need to do is I need to start collecting some data. So I'll just, I'll just, so I'm going to plot these roughly here. I'm going to read them out and you need to jot them down because you need to put them in a data table. So on the next page, you're going to do data table one. Oops, a daisy. And this is going to be basically, well, you're controlling the frequency. So, frequency. And you're going to have next to it delta v across the resistor this is in ohms and this is in hertz and then you're going to have a whole bunch of these things you might actually even need you know several columns of this for all i know You can do this afterwards. Just make a note as I say the frequencies, make a note. So fill in, fill in as we do this. So you're going to have plotting a graph. Hopefully, you're going to stop the tape and you're going to make your graph so you're on scale and then I'm going to come through and I'm going to mark them and I'm going to say what they are. So the first one is uh, frequency 29.7 that's basically 30 and this is 3.423 so 30 and 3.423 is round about there. So 29.7 and 3.423. And then 40.25. 40.25. And this is going to be 2.39. 2.39 so 40.25 2.392 
3.3 oops a daisy 71 and then we get 31.29 somewhere in there and that's going to be 3.51 3.51 is there and then 24 point four five twenty four point four five two 2.202 2.202 and then 27.36 or 27.36 2.945 2.945 and then 33 .08, 33 .08, 33 .08, and 3.386 3.386 there and then 43.78 43.78 and that's going to be 2.018 2.018 and then 59.47 and then 10.4 so 10 Point four is there. I'm sorry, no. Ten point no, that's right. Ten point four is yep, yeah, ten point four is there and zero point five one two. So oh zero point five one two. Yep. Yeah. So ten point four and zero point five one two. And then 16.7, 16.7, and then 1009, and then 18.32, 18.32, that's about there again. And this is one one eight two one one eight two round right about there. And then twenty eight point two four twenty eight point two four twenty eight point two four three point one six. 28.24 mm, okay 29.27 29.27 which is there and that's going to be 33 three. mm. I wish we had something in the high 30s that's a that's all my lab partner did and let's clean it up and have a look 
So your job is to listen and then develop a graph like that. A bit more precise than mine is because mine is you know, freehand. But notice there's a there's a definite trace here. And it's not perfect, these two guys. Mm. Now, at this point, what I would do is I would go in and fill a few points and I'd do a point here, I'd do a point here. I'd do a few more points around this, this top here to try and pin that down. I might go back and look at these two guys again and see. Um, but there's my trace. Now, what I need you to do is I need you to fill out this data table from the last piece of video. So listen, oops a daisy, listen and fill, because you all are my lab partner. We're in this lab together, you're my lab partner. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go away, I'm going to draw this out on a proper piece of paper and then we'll, we'll compare. Okay, so let's put this, I'm a bit worried about people who just course through this so I'm going to put little messages onto them. You need um, a ruler graph paper version. Okay, and then I'm going to wait and do this. And we're almost there. Let's call it a day. So, pause. so uh, welcome back. Here's my graph, and just to highlight some things, you always have the title on it, and then I have my voltage across the resistor, and I counted the number of squares. And as long as I end up over halfway up the page, I'm happy. So I did two for every, I did two for, uh, each square was worth two, which is a nice scale. And then going across, oh sorry, each step was worth 0 0.2. And then going across, I went up to 60 and each step was worth two. So easy scale to work with. I put in my points and I put them in with point protectors so that in 10 years time I'll know that was a des that was a data point and this is a little smudge that's just been left over the years and then um, I drew the smooth curve through them I'm using ink you can use pencil if you want to keep things for a long time when they're in pencil you just photocopy it and then stick it in your book and it'll stay for 60 years and then I Try to see the peak and I trace that value down and I got something like 31.3 and I'm going to put a little bit of a window on it. I'm going to say somewhat arbitrarily it's between 30 and 32 um, just by looking at this top of this graph between 30 and 32 on that and um, that's a that's a decent graph. You look at that graph and people will see exactly where you're coming up with the data and etc. If you're not good at drawing these lines, just practice makes perfect. Although you can get a thing called a flexi curve, which is a, a bendable ruler, which helps. But practice is fine. Draw it light to begin with and then just get, get uh, you get darker as you're happy with the line. It's like everything else. It's, it's hard at the beginning, but it gets easier. Okay. So 30 to 32 hertz. So then let's have a look at this. Hmm. Oh, one final thing. Notice, not symmetrical. 
um, just by the by if this is linear and that's inverse then um, let's see my high frequency side has a higher shoulder than my low frequency side and um, boom, boom, boom. can I justify that and um, actually I would have thought it would have gone the other way but but asymmetrical <laughs> take what you can get it's asymmetrical and then this last little thing is the uh, discussion uh, sorry is the conclusion always make a conclusion to the point if you've got any discussion put it in a discussion section so the predicted value for the resonant res on ant frequency if you like tuning frequency I'm trying to get to use both words of our L R C network was and I've forgotten so I'm going to look back 41.3 Hertz forty one point three hertz the measured frequency was between thirty hertz and 32 Hertz these are not consistent they're not consistent you don't need a you don't need a comparison diagram to show that they're not consistent and not consistent by quite a bit if we go back and mark 41.3 on our graph 41.3 is there significantly out there's there's no comparison this is predicted and I hate to say it but I'm not 100% sure why I'm a little bit concerned about this inductor you know it's been suggested that it's straight straight capacitance because all these wires are close together but that's a significant amount of straight capacitance I'm a little bit concerned about that inductor and at some point I need to get a different inductor and just um, figure it out it's not an air cooled it's not an air core inductor it is a iron core inductor and that concerns me a bit but that's as far as I've got with it so there we have it so lab partner your job is to write this up 